Good morning, everybody. Those of you in the room and uh, those of you connected through Zoom. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Xavier Arcon. I will do a short bio. Uh, I, I will talk uh, about him as a researcher and science manager, but uh, I think I can, we can say that he's a friend. He has a long story with us. Uh, Xavier, in fact, uh, got his degree in physical sciences here. So he's an AUB alumni. And then he got his doctorate in the University of Cantabria. Uh, then he became a research professor at CESIC. He was the first director of the Institute, uh, Institute of Physica de Cantabria, the Cantabria Physics Institute, where he created the first research group in Spain working on X-rays. Uh, then he moved, as all of us did, some postdocs, and he was involved in the main space observatories of X-ray, uh, XMM Newton and uh, Athena, New Athena now. Then he was member of, uh, in several uh, roles of si Space Science Advisory Committee of ESA. Then uh, he entered the, uh, the Council of ESA. And uh, now, since 2017, he's the Director General of ESO, the European Southern Observatory. And uh, he has a lot of awards. And uh, this afternoon, you are becoming member of the uh, Real Academy of Sciences. Oh, so are you in the top? You are a member of the Royal Academy of Sciences. Ah, yeah, since last year, and you're giving a talk. So you have the opportunity to hear him again, but in a more uh, scientific approach uh, this afternoon. So thank you very much for sharing your time, your time with us. And uh, oh, we forgot the microphone. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. Yes, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, among friends. Uh, I was counting this morning that the first time I entered this building was 42 years ago. So not, uh, yeah, not a small number. Uh, and of course, with uh, lots of memories that come to mind, you know, even the elevator that I used this morning, it's, it's still the same that I used 42 years ago. Uh, uh, not a cafeteria that has improved. Uh, okay, so, um, all right. Uh, I'm going to, of course, uh, tell you about the business that I'm taking care of at the moment, which is ESO, the European Southern Observatory. I will, I will uh, explain to you where we are, what we're doing, uh, what are our uh, current projects. And I would like to end, uh, especially um, in the final slides, with uh, the title that I put into this uh, presentation, which is Opportunities for R&D. And that's uh, that's uh, meant to be not only uh, for uh, uh, research, but also for development opportunities for for uh, students, for engineers, for uh, research uh, groups, and also even for industry. Although I don't believe there's anyone from industry here, but just in case. Um, fine. So, um, okay. Uh, let me see. Okay, don't worry, I can use the mouse. Oh yeah, okay. Right, so here's a massively unfair summary of some of the scientific breakthroughs that uh, ESO, the European Southern Observatory, has um, enabled uh, uh, to the scientific community. And some of them have been uh, Nobel Prize winning scientific results. Uh, all of them remarkable. And uh, I think this is just a, a, a bit of a glimpse of the type of, of advances that, that we enable through building and operating world-class astronomical facilities, which is what actually our organization does. Um, uh, actually, there's more than a thousand papers, refereed papers being published every year by the scientists using data from ESO observatories. Um, uh, and I want to underline here one important thing uh, from 2023, which is that 45% of these papers use the ESO archive. We have a very well curated ESO archive facility, and it's it's uh, heartwarming to see that this 
leads in a number of occasions to a second life to the data that that it's so expensive and difficult to take. So it's very, very good to see that, that the archive is being used. And actually about 15% for ALMA, 20% for the optical observatories only use scientific uh, data from the archive. They don't require new observations. So that's that's really uh, very good. But uh, yeah, I think it's a very respectable number. Uh, and, and that's actually what we deliver at the end of the day. Um, now, this is what we're looking at uh, 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 in the future, uh, what we would like to see, uh, what we would like to learn from uh, longer time in the future. There's lots of things, of course, that are just becoming possible now. Uh, you all know that uh, we've got evidence of at least two interstellar visitors in the solar system. We want to know a lot more about them, about their chemical composition, about what they come from. Um, uh, of course, one of the holy grails is to find another Earth orbiting another sun uh, that uh, may come, not sure, in my lifetime. Uh, um, we want to know a lot more about uh, physics of black holes by getting closer, uh, closer to the innermost stable circular orbit. Um, we want to see the first light in the universe in terms of first stars that started to shine in very early galaxies, as well as the cold gas out of which these stars form. And yeah, there's even fancy things like um, trying to measure acceleration in the expanding universe in real time. This is something that uh, we may be able to do in the future. And of course, we don't know what will come. Every single big project that has been designed in astronomy or in any uh, other facet of science, it was designed with some scientific requirements in mind, like a big example is the Hubble Space Telescope. It was designed to measure the Hubble constant, and yes, it did. Uh, but it's only, you know, one of the 10 most important discoveries that Hubble made. So uh, we should be prepared for this to discover the uh, unexpected. So, uh, yeah, that's our mission uh, to design, build and operate advanced ground based observatories and foster international collaboration for astronomy. That means not only in research, but also in engineering, technology and that type of things and outreach. Um, that's our vision. Uh, that's where we're heading to uh, advance uh, humankind's understanding of the universe by working with and for the astronomical community. That's important. We work together with the R&D institutes and what we do, what we deliver, it's actually feeding them uh, with, with uh, best possible data by providing world leading facilities. This, is, this will remain our task for the years to come. We, yes, yeah, something doesn't work. Hello. Uh, eh, Xavier, no, no me se veo el primer slide del PowerPoint, eh, pero se se pasa el los slides. Ara, yes, yes, now, yes, it's, it's the same slide, yes. Ara es veu our values, no? Ara es veu el slide que, que també està projectat a la pantalla vostra, sí, sí, ara sí. Uh, apologies, problem is sharing the screen. Okay, yeah. good, thanks. So, um, well, yeah, I was uh, saying that our values actually reflect our commitments with society on this. I mean, we don't do this for ourselves. We actually work for the community. And uh, uh, this is this is important. We support our community, um, providing outstanding services. We strive for excellence and innovation. Sustainability, it's playing even uh, every day a more important role. I'll come back to this uh, very briefly at the end. And of course, as part of social sustainability, diversity and inclusion is also something that we care about. Um, Okay, now this will not work. Don't worry. Um, no? Yes. Okay, so a few, yes, a few facts and figures. Um, our organization is an intergovernmental organization. Uh, it was founded in 1962 by five European countries. Today we have 16 uh, member states and we have um, 
partnerships with Chile, where we have our telescopes, and also with Australia. With, uh, then we have signed a 10-year partnership agreement uh, in 2017. Uh, we have something like 750 people working uh, with us of 30 different nationalities. Um, uh, 450 of them are in Germany, another 300 in Chile. Uh, our member states are the ones that fund our activity. We get something like 228 million from them per year. Uh, uh, th that goes in proportion to the gross domestic product. Uh, so there's no debate on what is my share there. If they don't take advantage of their investments, that's a different problem. So uh, uh, member states have to work hard to support their community to make sure that they they take good advantage of, of the investments. We're actually spending a lot more now of the other 400 million per year because we're building the ELT. Uh, so we use bank um, tools to move money back and forth. Um, and uh, roughly speaking, two thirds of the money we spend is actually in in developing new things, new instruments, new telescopes. And uh, we also have a um, relevant role in international science policy um, uh, among uh, yeah, uh, the, the relationships with a number of, of other uh, organizations of, of various types. So those are our headquarters. This is where we have our development hub. That's where we have uh, something like 250 engineers, actually. Um, uh, of all um, disciplines that, that work to develop new projects. We also have scientists uh, that uh, foster the scientific engagement with the community, but also that provide uh, uh, the needed support for the developments and also for the operations of the facilities. And we also have a planetarium there that I encourage you to visit. If you come and see us at any point, it's really very nice. Um, yeah, a couple of pictures here of clean rooms, uh, integration calls. Anytime you, you come to, to Garshing, uh, please uh, drop me a line and I uh, will be able to show you this. We have another little hub in Santiago. Um, uh, it's a sort of replicated version of what we have in Garshing, but without the development part. So it's mostly administration and scientific research and support to operations. And this is the telescopes that we have either today or that we're building for the future. All of them in northern Chile, in, in the uh, region of Antofagasta, which is really outstanding for astronomical research, not just for the optical and near infrared uh, bands, but also in the millimeter and submillimeter bands. So let me run through this. Um, most of you are familiar with it, but I, I think it's important that we realize what we have available so you can understand what the opportunities are. Um, La Silla, this is the first observatory that is established there. It's almost 55 years ago that it started working. Um, today, we operate only these two telescopes, these two 3.5 meter telescopes or 3.6 meter telescopes, and they are dedicated to two very specific scientific niches. One is radial velocities for the 3.6, uh, that of course has led to a number of exoplanets being discovered. Um, the other one is for transient follow-up, the 3.5 new technology telescope um, this is mostly dedicated to follow uh, uh, supernovae, gamma ray bursts, any other transient uh, events in the universe. Um, and um, on top of this, we have like 10 or 12 what we call hosted telescope projects. Those are small telescopes that are remotely operated by institutes in our member states. We provide the technical support and each one of them is uh, dedicated to specific um, uh, scientific goals. The last one to start its black gem. This is to uh, follow up, uh, especially uh, uh, gamma ray burst and gravitational wave events. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is a sort of platform now for this type of small projects. All of them produce uh, science dedicated to very specific uh, scientific niches. Okay, um, uh, fine, I'm happy with it. Um, so, uh, Paranal, this is, uh, in a different location. This is an observatory site at 2,650 meters height, uh, something like two hours south of Antofagasta. Um, this is the home of the very large telescope. You will see that we're very boring with telescope names. I mean, we we, we, we really should think about uh, uh, yeah, uh, taking a moment and naming them properly. Um, so this is uh, the top of Paranal. Uh, you see this big platform there. It's almost 200 meters across. And you see these four uh, big telescopes. Each one of them contains a primary mirror uh, of 8.2 meters. Uh, 
It's a glass mirror, it's monolithic. That's probably the biggest glass mirror you can build. Um, it's been uh, going for 25 years. Um, first light uh, was, uh, we celebrated first light in May last year, 25 years. So it's it's been a long time, uh, but uh, we make every effort to keep them up and running um, and obsolescence uh, projects to make sure that uh, we don't miss uh, a part when uh, something uh, fails and, and so on. Um, the uh, other smaller telescopes uh, were developed a bit later. They are smaller, they can be repositioned here in this platform. And with those four or the four big ones, we do actually uh, interferometry with infrared light, with near to mid infrared light. And it is physical interferometry. It's not like radio interferometry. So we actually make the light interfere of the various telescopes. It's not that we in make interfere the digitized signals. This is pretty unique. There's, there's, there's nothing as powerful in the world. And of course, there's been lots of scientific results as a result of, of, of this facility. And we also have a couple of survey telescopes there. We, in, you, we operate this as an integrated entity. So there's, there's, there's not uh, the case that there's one person dealing with each one of the telescopes. There's a team that deals with everything that includes science operations, it includes maintenance, on which we uh, spend a lot of effort. Otherwise, you know, after 25 years, this would have fallen into pieces. Um, adaptive optics is something that uh, it's, it's also now everywhere, or most of the optical uh, telescopes uh, use adaptive optics. Um, um, maybe I should add that these lasers that we use and that are now are commercial, uh, those were developed by us, were developed by ESO a long time ago. Those are high power lasers that we need to shoot into the sky to create artificial stars uh, because those are sodium lasers and they bounce at the sodium layer in the atmosphere at about 90 kilometers of altitude. So when we point the telescope in a certain direction, the, we, we see four bright stars around where we point the telescope and those red stars uh, send the light back to um, uh, wave front sensing cameras that we have and that tells the secondary mirror of the telescope how it has to change the shape to compensate for the turbulences of the atmosphere. And this, this delivers standing um, very high contrast, very high resolution astronomical images in the infrared from the ground. And, and that's that's really something that has delivered a, a lot of, of good science. We now have a project in development called Gravity Plus that will keep the other three big telescopes with one laser each. Uh, this is for a different purpose, but uh, that means that adaptive optics will now be available in all the four eight meter class um, telescope units. Um, the interferometer I mentioned before, uh, this is, um, um, to achieve the resolution of the equivalent of 130 meter telescope in diameter, of course, only partially filled. And that's why we have uh, uh, all an infrastructure below with tunnels and delay lines and so on. This is to make the light interfere of the various telescopes. And um, at 130 meter telescope, but a couple of microns, we achieve a resolution of two milli arc seconds, which is really, really amazing and from the ground uh, this is uh, a picture of one of the delay lines um, so the line enters here we have some carriages on top of these rails that we have to position very carefully so the light from the various telescope centers in phase so they can interfere and uh, that of course uh, also requires a lot of maintenance these rails have to be adjusted every morning uh, within a night micron precision uh, just as a fun fact, when this was installed um, almost 30 years ago, they couldn't make it work, uh, and they discovered the reason, uh, which for a geologist or for a, someone expert in geology, it should be obvious, which is that light travels straight while the rails follow the <laughs> geodesics of the, <laughs> of the Earth, so the rails were curved. So that's, that's now understood, of course, and, and it's all adjusted and it's taken into account. But it's a very high precision uh, infrastructure there and, and it costed a lot to develop and it's working by pressing a button now. Now, this is related to one of the opportunities I was mentioning before. How do we equip these telescopes with uh, state-of-the-art instrumentation? And, and this is the process, more or less. We have uh, 
strong partnerships with R&D institutes in the member states, generally with consortia of these R&D institutes. And uh, the way these instruments are developed is through uh, science drives. So people think uh, what would they need to achieve a certain science goal. Um, and that's what's driving the entire process. Uh, then we join forces with this consortia. We normally have calls and you know there's a process for this. ESO participates in the effort to provide these instruments. We pay part of this. And the part that we don't pay, which is provided by the institutes, probably out of their national funding, we compensate with guaranteed observing time. And this makes sure that this ensures that the people that develop these are scientifically driven and not just the company willing to make money. And that has been working very, very well for more than 30 years. There's, there's 20 instruments or 25, to uh, say the least, that have been developed following that scheme. When we get the instrument uh, properly commissioned, then we own it, we maintain it, we operate it, and we offer it to the community. And of course, the first one to use it is the team that have been developing it because they know better than anyone and because they have the observing time to do it. So they can address big scientific challenges. So that's, that's the model that we use. It's similar to the way that the European Space Agency uses to develop the um, instruments on board of the uh, science missions, but not quite the same because we're, we're part of the development and we pay. So that's, that's the, the main difference. So there's a lot of development ongoing at the moment. Uh, this Later this year, there will be two multi-object spectrographs arriving at, at uh, the VLT, uh, four more stand moons. Then there's a multi-conjugated optic optics instrument called MABIS, which is in development, an upgrade of force, an upgrade of gravity, which is an interferometer instrument, and also a new instrument in the UV part of the spectrum. So normally we have of that order six, seven projects in various phases of development, each one of them uh, in, in partnership with a different consortium of um, institutes uh, in the member states. So that's one of our big uh, um, telescopes, observatories in operations. This is the other one, which is ALMA. ALMA is the Atacama Large Millimeter and some millimeter array. This is actually not an ESO observatory only. It's a partnership with uh, the National Science Foundation um, in 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 the United States and the um, National Institute for Natural Sciences in Japan. Um, it is also in Chile. It's at 5,000 meters altitude. Uh, that if you have to uh, get any chance to observe in the sub millimeter, you have to be in a very dry and high place, and it, it, and it's still tough. I mean, uh, go into the, the sub-millimeter. I mean, our latest estimates, and Cisco will correct me, I hope not, is that we get something like 300 hours per year where we can actually observe in sub-millimeter um, uh, wavelengths. Uh, we observe, now we're reaching sort of 4,000 uh, hours per year in, in total, but uh, the biggest part is in millimeter wavelengths. Yeah, so there's 66 antennas in there that can be reconfigured and repositioned to uh, deliver different uh, performances in terms of um, uh, field of view, in terms of, of resolution, uh, depending on the receivers that you want to use. Moving one of these antennas is um, a nice show to see once in your lifetime um, with these big transporters. Uh, uh, but we try to do it as little as possible because it takes time and uh, it's time that we don't use for science. So that's uh, that's uh, we, we try to minimize this and move the antennas only when it's necessary. Um, yeah, um, so as I uh, said before, the way radio uh, astronomy does interferometry is different to what I explained before. You digitize the signal on site in the same antenna and then you mix the signals in the correlator. For this, you need to put a very precise clock uh, in, into tagging uh, what comes from the antennas and that's that's something that we do centrally. Um, of course, it has to be central um, uh, from uh, the 5,000 meters place. Uh, at the top right, you see uh, the correlator. We're upgrading it now. It's getting obsolete as well. Um, and on the bottom right, you can see the first front end of one of the antennas with all the uh, receivers uh, filled in. Now, we have no empty spaces anymore. So uh, that's all uh, now full. And that, that gives, of course, a lot more of... Um, of scientific possibilities. Still, our biggest uh, um, 
adventure for the next years. It's a sort of a 100 million, 150 million project that we call the wideband sensitivity upgrade. Um, uh, this this uh, requires the new correlator and many other changes, new digitizers, new transmission systems, and so on. Uh, so that's our main development program for ALMA to uh, power its um, capacities in the future. Um, ALMA is already 11 years old now. It has been going up and running for 11 years. Lots of scientific breakthroughs. Last year we had, sorry, the year before last, we experienced a cyber attack. Just, you know, that no one is safe uh, these days. And that interrupted observations for seven weeks. I think we're back to normal now. Interestingly, we're now doing the first dual time observations with James uh, Webb Space Telescope, also with the VLA, with the centimeter radio telescope in the United States. And next year, we're going to do also um, dual scientific observations with uh, the VLT, the very large telescope. Uh, it's a very highly subscribed uh, observatory. The chances that you get observing time are one to eight. So uh, yeah, you, you you have to 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 yeah, to write very smart science cases. And uh, yeah, this is creating lots of frustration as anyone can expect, but I don't think we can duplicate this at all. Now, this is what keeps us more busy at the moment, which is the construction of the extremely large telescope that will be the largest optical infrared telescope in the planet. Um, primary uh, mirror, it's uh, almost 40 meters across. It's not monolithic, it's made of 798 hexagons of about a meter and a half across. Construction started in 2015. We expect to have the first scientific light in 2028. We're more certain that we're going to have the telescope fully qualified in 2028. Cost is astronomic, unfortunately, 1.5 billion. Uh, and we don't count everything here, to be totally honest. We don't count the support that the organization is so provides to the project, and we don't count either the funding that the national agencies provide to their institutes to develop the instrumentation. Um, it is being erected not far from Paranal, only 24 kilometers away, and it will be operated together with the VLT and the VLTI in, a, in an integrated operations environment, and we're developing this, which is, sounds very nice to say, but it's not so easy. Um, there's two competitors to the ELT, as you know, in led by the United States. Uh, one is called the GMT, the other one is the TMT. Um, one is 25 meters, uh, TMT is 30 meters. Uh, they're both way behind us, sort of seven years, at least um, in their development. And none of them is funded to more than 50%. We're, we're funded to 100%, so we're on our own. So we're, we, we have to face our own miseries and technical problems to deliver this. but. It's going well. So we, we have completed 50% of the construction. You can see a few scattered things here, mirrors. Actually, this one. Ah, this one is in, in Cerdanyola del Vallès, by the way. They are, um, there's, there's a company called Sener, I'm sure most of you know they are developing the cells for the secondary and the tertiary mirror of, of the telescope uh, and, the, and the fifth mirror of the telescope as well. You can see boxes with segments of the primary mirror and uh, control electronics. That big thing there, which is 4.1 meters, this is the secondary. So the secondary mirror is 4.1 meters. It's it's hanging something like 30 meters above the primary and at an altitude from the ground of, of the order of 60 meters or so. Very, very scary, but apparently working. So this is a little bit of uh, the size and the scheme of the dome and the telescope structure, uh, uh, this uh, thing, is the auxiliary building from here to there, it's about 110 meters. The dome um, uh, diameter is 77 meters, more or less. Uh, this is the telescope uh, sitting on a pier, which is 55 meters across. Um, this is about 6,000 tons of steel. This is about 3,700 once we have all the glass in and, and everything. Um, so this is how the site looks like at the moment. The two uh, figures on the right hand side, the dome it's being now completed. It's started to be to be covered and the, the doors are being placed, but we're also building the telescope now. And you maybe see here, this is the azimuth um, bearing uh, tracks, sorry. Uh, those are the NASMIT platforms and that, that's where the 
instruments will sit. Um, so uh, it's it's very well advanced. It's moving at full throttle. Um, actually, a month ago they moved the dome. I think they called for a couple of people from Bilbao to move it. We, uh, there's no engines in there, so they moved it ten meters back and forth. Um, and uh, so it's it's all going fine. Um, now uh, in April they will ship the last pieces of all this thing from Italy. So uh, we expect to receive the provisional acceptance of the dome and the structure of the telescope in July 2026, which for me it will be a wonderful retirement present because I'm retiring in August 2026. Okay, good. Um, of the mechanics, of course, that's also the heart of the telescope. Uh, that's that's another nightmare, but uh, technically it's, it's making very good progress. Uh, we actually received the first 18 fully polished segments uh, or in January in uh, at the observatory in Paranal, uh, in March, they will start to put the reflective coating on it that we do there. We, we have our machines, they're fully qualified, our processes are well trained, and uh, yeah, we have something like 150 or almost 200 of those segments expecting acceptance in, in France to be shipped to, to Chile. Uh, uh, scary numbers here. I mean, this uh, the uh, RMS uh, is 10 nanometers uh, in one of these 1.5 meter segments and and uh, for the secondary the, the 4.1 meter telescope the rms it's already now 60 nanometers and they're going to go down to below 40 nanometers uh, across the entire mirror yeah um the m5 this this design has five mirrors not three uh, the m5 is the one that does the tip tilt this is very challenging uh, it has to be a lightweight mirror uh, we uh, want to fabricate it in silicon carbide, uh, polishing silicon carbide. It's a terrible thing to do, but uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to do it, and and we will see. Uh, we're we're procuring also a sort of backup commissioning mirror made of glass, uh, in case everything fails. So um, yeah, I mean all the rest of the pieces of the telescope are are progressing. We will start integrating the telescope in 2026, as I said, and uh, qualifying it uh, hopefully at around 2028 and then we will receive the first instruments hopefully um there's, there's four of them uh, being developed by consortia of uh, institutes in the member states uh, i don't want to go into this but this is very challenging we're talking uh, gigantic ventures here each one of these instruments is probably 100 million in cost they require gigantic uh, amounts of work and and yeah very very challenging so we're we're trying to monitor the situation and, and help as much as possible. And that, that's the last piece. This is the Cherenkov Telescope Array. This is not something that we're building, but it's something that we will operate in the southern uh, part in our uh, territory near Paranal in Amazonas. This will be the first uh, observatory of high energy gamma rays on the ground. Uh, there's experiments, as you know, in HES in Namibia, Magic in La Palma, Veritas in the United States. Uh, but this will be actually operated as an observatory. And um, uh, at the moment, we're experiencing legal issues with this, which is a place that no one wants to be ever. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, we will see how, how it goes. This is about the legal entity that will actually deliver the, the project. And that uh, yeah, we're having problems with the European Commission there that I really don't want to discuss today. Um, right, so that will be the future of that place, right? We'll have the uh, VLT. We have already the VLT and the VLTI in Paranal at about 24 kilometers across that road and the valley. We'll have the ELT and then hidden somewhere there, the CTA South. So that, that will be quite a massive astronomy hub um, in the area. Uh, that, that's, uh, that is uh, really, it will be really impressive. I said a few things about data management. This is the, the other part of the operation. So we, uh, one is the data acquisition, the other one is the data management. That means archiving, developing pipelines, um, developing advanced data products, et cetera. So we have also running a, a project called Dataflow System that will uh, change the way we deal with the data now and prepare it for the day when the ELT comes. Um, just to be clear, we're not on the big data, business here, our archive, it's something like a couple of petabytes and, and that doesn't grow, you know, like exponentially or anything like this, but still, of course, there's a lot of information in there and, and we need to make sure that, you know, the development, uh, the curation, 
and the quality control is, is at the highest possible standards. Uh, I want to say a couple of words about sustainability. I mentioned this before because it's important uh, for, for us, but let me start with yet another dimension here. I mean, this is all about astronomy. It's about science. It's, it's great. We're, we're, you know, most of our scientists, I was, I think, um, but uh, the benefits of what we do are uh, reach out quite a long way away from the pure scientific environment. And this is something that needs to be acknowledged. And um, here we have some examples. Uh, of course, besides science, we also do engineering that sometimes it's used for other things. We uh, invested more than 1 billion euros into contracts to build the ELT. So we have given 1 billion euros to companies, mostly in the member states. And, and this is something that of course moves the economy and generates innovation. Talent development, we uh, also spend quite a, uh, some effort into this. We have studentships, we have fellowships. We try to recruit young people that develop with us, then they may go somewhere else in the member states. I'll say a few words about this later. Education and, and outreach, uh, we invest something like 3 million per year in communication. The zillions of data products that we generate that are freely accessible. Uh, uh, by anyone, and uh, there's no book in astronomy today that doesn't contain ESO images, and that's because we put this effort. Education, we have this planetarium where we um, teach uh, uh, students, but we also teach the teachers how to teach astronomy, and and this is this is something that we also want to, to entertain, and, and then the uh, international collaboration and policy, in particular, for example, for protecting the skies. I've Got the good news this morning that uh, there's the UN agency called the uh, Committee for the um, Peaceful Uses of Outer Sky, of Outer Space, I'm sorry, that has agreed that for the next five years they're going to review at every meeting the state of the mega constellations that we have in uh, around the Earth that may become, you know, a real threat for, for astronomy. Um, there's no the UN has no power to stop this. That's the power resides in the nations, but uh, at least making them aware could eventually help to stop this. And as I said, sustainability, the way we understand sustainability at ESO, it's in these three facets, environmental, which is what everyone has in mind at the moment, of course. I mean, we have a planet that it's under, under threats and, and that, that's undeniable, but also societal and economic dimensions. Um, the planet is under threat when the first wall has been hit by this, but the third wall has been hit by societal challenges for a longer time, and we haven't paid any attention to this. So let's make sure that we don't save the planet at the expense of not saving the people at the same time. And this is something we need to keep in mind. In mind. Um, still, we're putting quite some effort into environmental issues, in particular reducing the carbon footprint, reducing the water, uh, reducing the energy consumption, uh, we, we use the technical, the standard um, means to monitor these and, and take actions. Uh, so we're buying green energy in, in, um, in uh, Germany. Um, this is in our territory. This is a 9 megawatt uh, photovoltaic plant uh, that was installed in 2022, July 2022. It's already operating. We're using it. And, and this is uh, really reducing our carbon footprint, and we need to do more of this. Uh, that's already prepared for the ELT and even for the uh, southern part of the Cherenkov Telescope Array. Okay, so um, I'm getting to the end. I'm, I'm going to slow down a little bit now because I want to talk about opportunities, which was the title of the talk. And I think this is, this is important. So first, opportunities uh, at ESO, data access. Um, our Science Archive facility, which you can uh, follow by clicking on this link, contains every single piece of data that ESO has ever uh, recorded in any of its observatories in 19, since 1996, which is when we started to operate the one meter ESO telescope in La Silla. Normally, all the data have a one year proprietary period. There is exceptions to this, uh, for example, for what we call public surveys. Uh, they became uh, public immediately, but you can access all the data uh, other than within this, this period that, that was ever taken. 
uh, the data that we store, it's both uh, the raw data and some advanced data products. I understand that we need to make more efforts into this together with the community. Um, we have a, a graphical user interface now that allows you to access the data from both optical infrared and uh, uh, radio telescopes of ESO as well. And we also make available data reduction tools, which is important. I mean, you make the data available and you don't have the tools that's of no use. Uh, so that's uh, that's important. And uh, by the way, now this is all uh, very fancy and uh, there's this open science initiatives uh, elsewhere in the community. Well, we were doing this 30 years ago, but we now want to call it a nicer name, which is the uh, European Open Science Cloud. Yeah, fair enough. So we're also part of this, we're also pushing for this. And and uh, this, as I showed at the beginning, that provides um, additional scientific benefits. Observing time, that's an interesting one. I got lots of questions about this. So uh, other than the 10% that our agreements uh, um, uh, recognize that have to be given to the uh, people working in Chilean institutions, the rest of the time, is based, is is distributed exclusively on scientific merit, and the way we define scientific merit is through community experts. So it's through you and to your colleagues across uh, the ESO member states and beyond. Um, we uh, do have a committee called the Observing Programs Committee that recommends how do we use the time for the La Silla and Paranal observatories. Um, in the case of Alma, it's a bit different because it's a partnership. So we have a share of 37.5. Uh, once you discount the 10% of Chilean time, it goes to 33 to 34%. Um, and uh, of about this 4,000 hours per year. So that's a very sizable amount of time. Of course, it's very highly demanded. So we need to be very careful in the way we administer this time. But it also goes through experts from the community. Calls for proposals for the La Silla Paranal Observatory. We have two calls per year. Uh, although um, in 2025, late 2025, we're going to have only one uh, call for year plus a fast track mode. That will mean that uh, the regular call will be once per year, but then we will always be open in case there's uh, something that needs to be done in between. And we're that requires a change in the tools that we have, in the way we process the calls and so on, and, and we, we're getting ready for this. For ALMA, it has only always been one, with one exception, uh, one call per year, and that's the intent uh, to continue it. Uh, it. We call it cycles. In the case of the optical telescopes, we call it periods. Um, we at the moment follow two very important practices. One is the double anonymous reviews. Uh, you cannot let yourself known in the, in the observing proposals. If you do, you will be disqualified. And every semester I have to agree that we disqualify, yeah, a dozen proposals because uh, some people still write in the proposal, I'm Professor X and I'm so good. Right, um, uh, so that we exclude, but also the reviewers do not know uh, 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 who they are reviewing and uh, the colleagues that review, they don't know each other either. So this is one thing. The other one is the distributed peer review. This is a different type of beast, uh, but um, it was simply impossible, in particular for ALMA, to have a, a committee that would review 1,800 proposals per year. And, you know, the committee already had 80 people. And those people, some of them had to read and run 100 proposals each. This is simply not realistic. It was not uh, uh, related to the capacity of anyone. It's simply not possible to do a good job with 100 proposals. So the way we're doing this is that each proposal goes to typically eight, 10 colleagues. And those colleagues are the colleagues who have submitted proposals as well. So you want to get time, you have to pay your fee. You have to contribute to evaluating the others. And uh, there's, of course, lots of caution in doing this. We're following this very closely uh, and we're refining it, but this is the way to go. All the big observatories are doing the same, actually. Uh, and we're 
continuously scrutinizing potential biases. Of course, one of the biases that we wanted to get rid of with this double anonymous is uh, gender biases, uh, uh, but um, <clears throat> that's, that's not totally gone. I mean, the assertiveness of the language that we male use in writing proposals, it's a lot different than the one that, that women typically do. So that, that's something that it's not totally gone. It's decreased, we need to monitor it. Um, and the same for uh, seniority. I mean, the assertiveness is it's different. And okay, gender language, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, language bias, uh, even inside the ESO member states is terrible. I mean, but now think about Alma, we have Japanese, we have Chinese writing proposals. That's, that's, not, uh, that's not neutral. So all of these things are being monitored and uh, we're taking action to counterbalance. To counterbalance. Instrument development, oh, okay, all right, there's a mistake in here. Uh, instrument development, I think I miss uh, a slide here, yes. Okay, no problem. Uh, I think I explained before how this works. So we issue calls for instrument developments, consortia of R&D institutions of the member states, um, um, uh, say, yes, we are interested. Sometimes we have to make choices. Um, then there's the development. Think about 10 years, no less, until you get the, tel the instrument into the telescope, commission it, and it's ready for operation. Then you start to get your, your uh, guaranteed observing time, normally during a period of six to eight, to eight years, and you can do the big science. Um, that's how it works. Uh, the upcoming opportunities for optical infrared instruments. First one we're going to move, it's Blue Muse. It will start the phase A during this year. This is a, um, a multi-object uh, spectrograph in the blue. There's the equivalent in the red already, very, very powerful and very highly subscribed. Um, also opportunities in the second generation of ELT instrument. One is called Andes, this is a very high Ultra stable spectrograph with two channels, a visible one and uh, an, an near infrared one, and mosaic, uh, a, a multi object spectro uh, spectrometer for the ELT. Very, very powerful, very wide field. Um, in addition, we ultimately want to develop an extreme adaptive optics instrument for the ELT to take an image of this Earth orbiting that sun that we still have to find somewhere. Uh, that's not uh, immediate. Uh, this is still an R&D project, but it will come. For the ALMA development, as I said, we're focusing on the wideband sensitivity upgrade. We have now, we're about to uh, um, experience uh, something similar that we're doing uh, uh, with the uh, optical infrared uh, uh, instruments, whereby we can give a small amount of granted time observations in ALMA to contribute for the development of one of our receivers. Uh, this is still ongoing, but our intent is to increase the scope of this. So that's not because we're happy to give uh, granted time, it's because we want to engage the community, scientifically motivated community. Otherwise paying for everything, you know, doesn't engage anyone other than the companies. So that's something that will come in the coming years. Job opportunities, uh, there's no quotas of nationalities at ESO. Um, Spain has 10% more or less of our uh, international staff complement. Uh, Spain pays 8% of the bill more or less. So it's all dependent on merit again. And uh, I, I took a snapshot of the vacancies we have. At the moment, there's quite a number of them. Uh, and there's uh, quite important ones. There's a director of engineering that I'm trying to recruit. There is the uh, director of the La Silla Paranal Observatory that we're trying to recruit as well. There's the instrumentation program manager for all the optical inst infrared instrument uh, developments and a variety of, of jobs. We have various types of personnel. We have international staff members. Uh, we have what we call local staff members. This is only open to residents in Chile. Uh, we have fellows, uh, both in science and engineering. You need to have a valid PhD for this. Students, uh, this is very difficult in Spain. I know this because I was part of the system before 
uh, we offer one to two year periods of students in Spanish universities to be spent at ESO. Problem with the Spanish system is that if you do this, you, you, have, you, you cannot keep your grant, you cannot keep your studentship in Spain. And I have been claiming that this should be reformed, but to no avail, sorry. If anyone can help, that would be great. Um, interns for a few months uh, that we also have all across, uh, um, scientists, engineers, um, science communicators, even HR interns. And, and another figure that we rarely use, which is the paid, you know, uh, paid associate. Nationality does not play the role only in cases of equal, um, you know, someone from an, from an ESO member state, someone from outside an ESO member state. We would normally prefer someone from an ESO member state, but only if, if uh, they are really um, equal. Uh, last year, we released our diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. Um, we're watching this very carefully. We're increasing in terms of gender, the fraction of, of women uh, at ESO. Um, but uh, if, if it needs to be done, we may have to do something else in the coming years. We're at the level of something like 28%, which is way too low. Uh, but this, uh, essentially the problem we have is that in some of the openings that we have, mostly in engineering, there's it's very hard to find uh, female candidates these days. Very, very hard. It's it's okay in science, and actually in administration, it's it's the opposite. I mean, uh, women are overrepresented in all roles. Starting, you know, my director of administration is a woman. My head of human resources is a woman, and uh, yeah, I mean, all the responsibility jobs are taken by women almost. Um, so that's that's something that that we're, we're we're watching. We're providing diversity maps to the recruitment panels so they know where the people will be inserted, and they can take this into account when making a recommendation. Industrial contracts. That's I think the last bit I wanted to underline. Uh, we procure our goods and services uh, from external companies. Uh, obviously, I mean we don't build things ourselves. Uh, preferentially from ESO member states and Chile. If we cannot find it there, then we can go out. We can go to the US eventually. We try to avoid it. Uh, we try to avoid even harder going to Russia. I mean, that's a no-go these days, but uh, also in the past. Um, now, uh, we issue calls for tenders uh, to selected companies. And how do we choose these companies? That's explained later. I mean, every ESO member state has an industrial liaison officer. This is the person who tells us, look, in our country, we have this company that can deliver this, that company that can deliver that. We cannot know this. So at the end, we, we make a map of this and we invite the companies that are, that, that are uh, capable of delivering reliably the components that we need. We assign the contracts. Again, there's no geo return at, at ESO, unlike ESA based more frequently now on best value for money. This is a formula that takes into account the technical, commercial, and price uh, um, of the offer. And as I said, there's no, no geo return. The role of the industrial liaison officer I have already underlined, and uh, we provide everything. You know, We need to provide water for the observatories. We need to provide the food for the observatories. We need to uh, uh, contract the service company to do the cleaning. But also we need to contract um, engineering technical services to support observatory operations. We outsource quite a lot of software effort, uh, um, information technologies. All this is available commercially. What's available commercially, we try to procure from the outside. We try to do our core business only. Uh, so there's not much coming from for the ELT. This is all given out now. As I said, it's of the order of a billion. But these are the opportunities in the in the future. Um, the wide band sensitivity upgrade of Alma. Uh, we still need to decide what we're going to do, but I'm sure that digitizers, software, all these things we will have to provide from the ESO side. Uh, upgrades to instruments in Paranal. Uh, we're thinking about equipping another of the emitter telescopes with a laser guide star facility. We're developing something called the integrated operations program. This is uh, digitizing. Uh, going to a more remote and lean uh, and still high performance operation to the observatories. Not everyone operating the observatory needs to be there, but that requires a lot of digitization, Internet of Things, smart operations, all these things. All this is upcoming. 
And last but certainly not least, uh, um, we're discussing with our council that in the next couple of years, we will discuss with the community and have them agreeing what will be the next big program after the ELT. Not that we have the resources to start it now, but we need to identify the nature of that uh, next uh, big observatory because in, in four or five years from now, uh, our people will start to uh, finish their, their contracts, to finish their work for the ELT, and we need to know what we need to prepare for in, in the future. So that exercise we will do together with the community, and of course that will generate uh, also industrial opportunities. Um, I hope that this is my last one, uh, not even a, a summary, but uh, yeah, a little bit of a, a takeaway message. Um, for our business, after 60 years, the support from the member states remains critical. Also the partnership with the community, with the institutes, with universities, with industry. Um, we're putting our member states in an envious position uh, compared to the colleagues in the US and elsewhere. Uh, they will have access to the ELT, to the largest optical infrared telescope in the world, and no one else will have it for at least a period of seven to ten years. So that's this, this will be very powerful for European uh, ground-based astronomy. And yes, looking forward beyond 2030, we need to start preparing for that future that is already knocking at the door. Thank you. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions. Those of you connected through Zoom, uh, if you can raise a hand, I will check from time to time. In the meantime, if there are questions here, for Xavier. Thank you, Xavier, for the talk. Uh, I would like to ask you a bit more about the future. Uh, you promised us a hundred meter telescope and you downgraded to 39. Oh, that was I the didn't. no, you didn't. You didn't, but that was the excitement in the in the community that we were going to have the ultimate telescope on Earth, right? That would have we, been we are. You know, uh, so what are the ideas that uh, ground-based astronomers are having? At least some kind of uh, taste. So, so we can get an idea of what are people planning for the future, at least the students in the room, like yeah. you were. 50 years ago, you know, what are they having going to have? Yeah, thank you, Raul. Um, I don't know. I mean, we, we need to do this exercise. I know a couple of ideas that parts of the community uh, concepts are uh, working on. Uh, one of them is a, um, it's a white um, field spectroscopic survey telescope. Uh, another one is a big submillimeter uh, uh, telescope, big submillimeter dish equipped with proper instrumentation, but there's, there's, I'm sure, many others there. I mean, for example, a serious upgrade of some of our facilities, like the VLT, you know, could we put maybe more telescopes in the platform and, and have more baselines for interferometry? Pick, uh, there's, there's something I didn't mention today, but most of the ESO facilities have been focusing on deep sky. So we're, we're, we're in the business of high resolution here, rather than in the business of, of wide fields, right? Is that something good or bad? I don't know. I mean, do we want to stay in where we're, we're very good in our business? Do we want to open to Whitefield uh, uh, um, adventures? I don't know. Um, there's been talk during the ALMA development uh, uh, thinking about uh, lots of things, like adding more antennas, uh, like, of course, that will require yet a new correlator. Um, um, so all, all these things are, are possible. And, and of course, we need to decide with the community not only what is the most scientifically attractive opportunity, but what is it that we can do so we don't do the old business again, right? I mean, the old was a, an, an idea which that triggered a lot of development in the community, but it was simply not feasible. I mean, a 100 meter telescope today, it's not even not feasible. Today, it doesn't even have a science case that I know. So um, that's that's the reality. Maybe in 25 years, when we are fed up of exploiting the ELT, we'll say, oh yes, yeah, if we had the 100 meter telescope, maybe we could do that thing. Today, we don't see that. Yeah. But the white field spectrograph that could yeah. cover the whole sky, that would be very exciting, right? Yes. 
And uh, at the end of the day, I like to uh, see astronomy as uh, as the CMB. You collect all the data that there is there because it's not. We are not experimentalists. We are observers, right? Yeah. You put it on your web server and yeah. then you let the next generation play yeah. with the data. Yeah. That's one thing I want to emphasize. I was very impressed by the fact that you have all the data available for yeah. for the next genius to figure out what to do with the data. That's very yeah. impressive. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, Xavier. Uh, so I wanted to ask you a bit more about uh, how adaptive optics are going to work in this ELT. So, you know, um, I think the diffraction limited to microns is like one hundredth of an arc second, something like this. But in what conditions you will be able to get there? Uh, for what magnitudes of stars? I mean, you know, what uh, what do you need exactly to? Yeah, we don't we don't know yet. Uh, we we don't have the um, the ultimate instrument to do extreme adaptive optics, uh, which is what you would need to get to the diffraction limit. Um, uh, and as I said, this is an, an R and D project, so you will need a lot more of actuators, uh, second order corrections, and things like that. That that the technology is not even available there. So. Um, yeah, the, at the moment, uh, the ELT will have six lasers, um, uh, which is, I mean, some uh, people think that we should have eight, maybe. Um, uh, the highest um, um, resolution will be achieved with an instrument called Mikado. Uh, Fed, uh, we're talking, you know, author of, of the order of, um, oh, what is it, 15 um, milliseconds, something like this. Uh, no, it's less than that. Uh, sorry, it is being fed by um, um, another instrument called Morfeo that has two deformable mirrors already. So it, it will go um, something like um, a factor of five better than what we can achieve today with our VLT, with our UT4. So that's, that's the realistic horizon with the instruments we have. But to go to extreme adaptive optics performance, there's a lot of R&D that you need to do in the field. Uh, just a curiosity, Xavier. You commented on the some uh, science cases that are using uh, James Webb, ALMA, VLT, and J JVLA. Hmm. Which kind of uh, science cases, uh, just as an example, how it is prioritized and uh, how many time it's spent to that? So it's curiosity in the terms of which science I, what are we doing in this context? So uh, the first version of which science should be it was written by Siska. So uh, I, th I think she should answer the question. Uh, while she gets the microphone, I will tell you that uh, it, it is tough to get time into facilities, even through the channels that we have put together. For example, in the first round of, of uh, cycle planning of ALMA, there was no proposal selected using ALMA and the VLT. There's, there's no for the next one. But uh, uh, sister, please help me out. Yes, so I, I focus, I did indeed work on this, but I focus mainly on the on the crosstalk with the VLT. Uh, so for instance, if you look at the Muse instrument, it has a uh, spatial and spectral resolution that is very comparable to, to ALMA. And so you can look at, for instance, outflows of galaxies in different line traces. So with ALMA, you can look at molecular lines and then with Muse, you can look more at uh, atomic species and you can uh, trace various properties. So that is, that is an example. Also in disks uh, around uh, young stars, planet forming disks, you can uh, you can follow the gas with ALMA and um, uh, I don't actually, it's maybe scattered light in <laughs> with the VLT. There were different, there were different science cases, but at the time that I wrote this, there were maybe about 10 studies or so where people had independently gone to ALMA and to VLT to get data sets and combine it in a paper. So it was because both of these are, are very much oversubscribed. So it was quite difficult to get time on both observatories. So with this channel, with this channel, we were trying to uh, sort of uh, mitigate that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I wasn't. Yeah. 
Yeah, so so the, the so I wasn't involved in the discussions with JWST, but the idea is that because you're working with two very uh, competitive observatories and it's very difficult to get observing time on both telescopes, even if it's crucial for your project. And if you have only data on one facility, uh, maybe it's not so valuable. So that's why this dual channel has been introduced. So you get two uh, uh, observatories at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then I also have a question actually. Mm -hmm. okay. So you emphasize that M5 uh, yeah. is made of uh, silicon carbide and yeah. that it's very difficult to polish. Yeah. But there's another thing with silicon carbide and that is that it has a spectral feature in the infrared, a very strong spectral band is this an issue or uh mm, I, I don't know you don't know what this i mean the of course uh this this gets coated at the end yes with, with reflective material with the reflective material so it, yeah it's simply the substrate of the mirror that right that it's made either of glass or or silicon carbide okay yeah the, the the advantage of silicon carbide of course is that it's a lot lighter than, than glass and and then you can do the diameter that you need to also uh, reflect the, um, the the laser light uh, for the wavefront sensing cameras. Mm -hmm. um, with the um, with the glass, we can only do a single conjugate adaptive optics. That's that's the that's that's why we're willing to do silicon carbide. Right. Okay. okay. Oh, sorry. No, it was just to ask that then the motivation was just, uh, let's say, to have data because it's very hard to get it separately, but it's not motivated by the contemporaneous observations in time. You know, that they, they need to be taken at no. the same uh, moment. No, it's more motivated by the competition aspect. That if, if, you, if something cannot give you should oh, yes. The idea was that uh, maybe there one of the two parts of the proposal is uh, cannot really stand on its own, uh, and it really requires the other part, or maybe both parts cannot really stand on its own. But together, it's a really a fully fledged proposal. Uh, we wanted to sort of to overcome this uh, competition element because you know if you have an open over description of eight, nine, or ten. Uh, it's really, you know, a gamble, and uh, <laughs> so it is. It's not really to go for co uh, contemporaneous observations, although that could be a, an aspect. But it wasn't really to uh, to address that. It was more the competition. Yeah, we have done it at least once, uh, uh, um, observing the galactic setting simultaneously with uh, with Paranal and with Alma. So it is it is possible. Thank you for your presentation. Um, and can you comment a little bit more about the possible impact of the mega constellations of satellites on the particular in ELT or even in ALMA? So, um, well, I, I said before, uh, the, those facilities are uh, narrow fields of facilities. We concentrate you know, on, on high resolution, high contrast images. Uh, that, that means that we're normally not fully immune, but uh, less affected by by these mega constellations. Um, so, in the optical, <clears throat> uh, we estimate that uh, there will be very little spoiling, even if we go up to one hundred thousand uh, lower Earth bit satellites, which is where we could be in twenty thirty. Unfortunately, um, um, uh, only you know maybe at, at the beginning of the night or at the end of the night, which is when you when then, then when they are brighter, you, you could uh, spoil, you know, maybe um, um, uh, some uh, calibration observations or something like this. Of course, if we knew the positions that we can fold in, into our operational model and, and avoid, right? Uh, but even if we don't, uh, we, we're talking probably of the order of, of, in that zone of the order of 1% of the observations may be spoiled. This is very different to the uh, white Build uh, instruments like like the Rubin telescope. Of course, they estimate that about one third may be spoiled, which is which is a lot tougher, of course. Um, different story for Alma. Um, there, what the problem is is the noise actually, uh, um, because we're we're in a zone of avoidance of of all these satellites, so that there's there's no case in which they will point the the radio signals. They are producing radio signals, right? For telecommunication uh, towards us, but of course that increases the 
the overall noise, especially in the uh, low frequency bands in of alma in band one, in band two, even in band three, it could be uh, it could be an issue. Uh, but uh, the um, uh, frequency bands in which these operators intend to operate uh, should, in principle, not be affecting none of the ALMA bands. It, they will affect the SKA bands, though, directly. Although, of course, uh, there's also uh, you know, the avoidance zone and, and so on. So those are the, the two main uh, impacts, which are both negative. I mean, I, I, there's, there's, there's no doubt about this. Uh, but as I said, since our instruments are relatively narrow fields, uh, uh, they are relatively uh, protected. Any question uh, through Zoom? Maybe a last question from the audience here. Yeah, um, you mentioned that there are that there are fifteen to twenty percent uh, of uh, papers relying only on ISO archives. Yeah. Is it enough? Uh, can we do better, uh, especially in the context of sustainable science? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that we can do better. I think uh, it is important that everyone knows that the data are there and that can be used and that there are the tools to use them. Uh, I really don't believe we have any assessment of, you know, uh, why isn't that more used or, 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 or whatever. Um, about uh, the slow science business, that's for me, it's, it's, it comes from a totally different angle. It's, it's it's a different motivation, um, independent of whether uh, science has to be slowed down or can keep going. It it is our duty to make sure that the data that is in the archive can be used and uh, that that the best possible tools to to analyze them are available. I I, I didn't say this, but I mean we have. Um, I think it's a hundred thousand registered users in the archive, uh, and uh, those come from one hundred and thirty countries. You can imagine some of these countries do not have direct access to observing time of any telescope, and still they they use our archive. So that's that's something that I consider a good a good legacy. Yeah, I think we can leave it here. Yep. Just a quick uh, daring question. In the same way that you started, uh, ESO started in optics and uh, made a collaboration with ALMA, radio astronomy, any change in the future you will kind of establish any link with the gravitational wave uh, community? Yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't mention today, but we, uh, uh, the um, August 2017 Kilo Nova event, uh, we spent 150 hours of telescope time. And actually, our observations were critical to say that this was a kilo nova. I mean, we, we used one of our instruments, which is called X shooter. It, it, it's a spectrograph that goes from the UV to the, uh, to the mid infrared, well, to the near infrared, and uh, monitoring the, uh, the, uh, the evolution of the target uh, for, for weeks. And it was, it's very nice. You see the black body first, and then you start seeing uh, all the features, all, all the metal features of, of uh, that are there. It, it was really very nice work. Yeah. Yeah. But there's, there's nothing preventing us, for example, that our next big project may be a partnership with the Einstein Telescope. Okay, let's thank again the speaker and we break for lunch. Thank you, Xavier. Thank you.